afternoon, everyone. So I have a challenge. I have 15 minutes to describe quantum mechanics, quantum information theory, and quantum computing to you. Uh, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try to give you a high-level view and a view of um, me, a, a lowly engineer. I'm not a quantum physicist by any means. But I'm going to try to describe to you a little bit about what is so interesting about quantum computing and why I think it's going to potentially change the landscape of computing in a big way. It may be one of the largest innovations that we've seen in, in decades in the field of computing. So let me start off with a little bit of what is a quantum computer. So a quantum computer is simply a computer that uses the laws of quantum mechanics to do computation. And as you all know or understand that, that quantum mechanics are the most fundamental laws of the universe. It's, uh, all physicists agree that they describe in gory detail how everything in the universe works. The trick of building a quantum computer is to take those laws and implement them into something that actually computes. It, it's built around something called a qubit or a quantum bit. So those of you that uh, have taken uh, computer science classes know that computers use bits, zero and one, to identify two different states. Quantum bits can be in the superposition, or they can be in both states at the same time, which is kind of a mysterious thing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. The challenge to building a quantum computer is they operate in very extreme environments, and the enemy of quantum computing is, is, the, is noise, is the environment, and temperature, and electromagnetic interference, and things like that are what causes quantum computation not to work. So you have to build a very extreme environment to, to, to capture the quantum computation. And it enables a whole different way of looking, a whole different kind of uh, software algorithms, and a tool that is usable in a way that classical computing, or computing as we know it today, when classical computing really refers to uh, machines that were the first electronic computers back with John von Neumann in 1948. Everything from that to now has really been a classical computer. Quantum computers implement a whole different way of accessing quantum resources that I'll talk a little bit about. So quantum mechanics, there are three effects, and I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail, but there are three effects that really are part of any quantum uh, mechanical system or a quantum computer. And the first is this thing called superposition that I mentioned. A qubit has this interesting property that it can be zero and one at the same time. And it's not that it's half in one state and half in the other state. It really is in two states at the same time. In fact, a lot of scientists believe that it's actually in two universes at the same time. So when you have a particle that's in this state, it could be that it's actually in two universes at the same time. Now, that's kind of an interesting party trick, but it really doesn't do much until you string these qubits together. And that's where the power of the quantum computer comes in. There's another interesting property called entanglement, where if you have one of these qubits and they're in this interesting state, or any quantum mechanical object, and you have it here in this state, and you, you keep it together with another qubit, they influence each other, you can actually take that qubit or that, that quantum mechanical object and move it millions or hundreds of miles away, and it will still, when you change this state, it'll magically change that state. That's not so important for quantum computing, because the entanglement is all within a very small box, which is actually the, the processor itself. And then there's another property called quantum tunneling, which, which aids in things called optimization problems that, uh, that are my, uh, uh, my peer at one qubit will be talking about in the next, uh, next presentation. So why build a quantum computer? Why are we interested in doing this? There are classes of problems that are beyond the scope of all computers. If you put all the supercomputers in the world or all the supercomputers that could be built, there are certain classes of problems that scale in a way that you can't manage them with classical computing. So quantum computing opens up this whole new space of problems that are extremely hard or if not impossible to solve with classical computing resources. It also does it for particular problems in a more efficient way. Now, don't get me wrong, this is not a replacement for all of classical computing. This is a system and a tech set of techniques that will be used alongside classical computing, which what I would call a hybrid approach, where you're using classical resources along with quantum resources. The picture you see there is a D-Wave system. That's our D-Wave 2 system. It consists of a very large box, which has ultimately in it a processor that's the size of your fingernail. It's a chip, and that chip is the quantum processor. 
the bulk of the machine is a refrigerator and some exotic machinery to bring the temperature down to uh, very, very low temperatures so that that quantum uh, mechanical computation can happen. Let me give you some application examples. So they, these range all over the map. And uh, our, one of our customers is NASA uh, and Google. And they are doing things like searching for exoplanets, so mining large amounts of data looking for patterns in that data which indicate an exoplanet, a planet that's outside our solar system. So they've actually done this in small-scale prototypes and on their way to doing it in larger and larger ways. So that, you know, there could be a vision you know, within five years where they actually do find new exoplanets using quantum computing technology. We were working with a number of cancer researchers on finding better ways to do optimization of cancer therapy, radiotherapy, finding the, you know, the best treatment for um, tumors so that you're doing the minimal amount of damage to the surrounding tissue. That's a very complex optimization problem. And um, one qubit will be talking about some finance applications that is applicable to this, uh, to, to, to this technology. I won't go through that in detail because th they're gonna go through it a lot more. The types of problems that we focus on for quantum computing are in these three categories. Quantum opti uh, complex optimization, Machine learning, which you heard this morning, is one of the most exciting things going on in, in AI today. Uh, and in the area of what's called sampling, or Monte Carlo simulation, which is used very heavily, as you know, in finance to do things like value at risk calculation, portfolio analysis, and so on. There are different ways to build quantum computers, and people have been trying to build quantum computers for about 20 years now. Um, there's different models and different theories of how quantum computers are built. The model that we chose is called the adiabatic model. It's a mouthful. It comes from MIT. So the theory of it, or the, uh, the model of it, comes from MIT. It was, uh, it was uh, published in a paper in 2000 by Ed Farhi and some other scientists at MIT. So what we've done at D-Wave is actually implement that technology. And the basis, or the way you implement a quantum computer, uh, it can be quite different too. So we chose to use superconducting electronics. So this is very low temperature electronics. Uh, and the chip that we have, as I mentioned, runs down at that very low temperature. There are other ways to do quantum computers. Uh, the guy that won the Nobel Prize for Physics last year, Dave Weinland, uses ions and he manip manipulates ions with, uh, with lasers. Great science uh, and uh, I'm sure they'll help eventually build a quantum computer out of that also. So one way you could describe how our computer works is you can think about a landscape. And the challenge in this landscape is find the lowest point or the valley in that landscape. So how do you do that? You think about how you would do that as a programmer or if you tr actually try to traverse it as a hiker, finding that lowest, uh, lowest point in the valley. And the hard thing is you have to really traverse the entire landscape to get the absolute best answer, to get the what's called the lowest energy state. So what's interesting about a quantum computer is it can search through a vast number of answers in effectively one processing cycle. So this computer, if you think about it, we have 512 of these qubits, these quantum bits. And if you string all those quantum bits together, because each of those bits can be in those two properties at the same time, you can actually represent numbers that are astronomical. So 2 to the 512 is 10 to the 154th power. So in every computation cycle, this computer is considering 10 to the 154 possible answers and trying to find the best of those possible answers. That's enormous, 10 to the 154th, there's only 10 to the 80th or 10 to the 90th atoms in the universe. And as the number of qubits scale, you can see that the power grows dramatically. So today in our labs, we have a 1,000 qubit processor, so that would be two to the 1,000. So that's not directly indicative of the performance that you will see from the machine, but it is an indicator of what's really going on in the machine and, and some of the future scalability that you'll see from this, this type of computation. Quantum computing does not scale linearly like the computing that we've seen and enjoyed for the last uh, 30 or 40 or 60 years, if you go back to von Neumann. It scales at some exponent. 
So we're going to see power that's going to be absolutely enormous over the next decades coming out of quantum computing. And we're at the very dawn of that age. There are some problems, though, that all quantum computers are probabilistic. They don't give you exactly the right answer. You have to draw many samples to try to get the best and better answer. They're inherently probabilistic. But lots of problems in math, the problems that I talked about today, uh, and, and you'll see later on, are all uh, can take advantage of the, sort of a probabilistic uh, uh, capability. So let me talk a little bit about the uh, the environment. So uh, Peter mentioned uh, talked a little bit about um, the the cold environment that we have. So the picture that you see on the right hand side is inside a D wave system. The chip is actually at the very uh, lowest part there, the processor, which again is about a centimeter squared. All the apparatus around it is shielding to drive down that temperature to what's called 20 millikelvin. So zero degrees Kelvin is the lowest possible temperature that you can have in the universe. It's minus 273.15 degrees C. This computer runs just a little tiny bit above that. So it's an extremely cold environment and a pretty exotic refrigerator to do that. The reason for that is to keep all this interference away from the chip itself. You probably remember from your physics, temperature is molecules moving around. So you want to keep those molecules as still as possible so that you can tap in and do this quantum computation without interference. And we could show if you bring this temperature up to 30 millikelvin, it doesn't compute anymore. So it's a necessary part of the system. It's also shielded to 50,000 times colder, uh, sorry, 50,000 times less than the Earth's magnetic field. So magnetism interferes with it. It's in an incredible vacuum. Uh, so we think that these are probably the rarest environments in the world, uh, in the universe, unless there's other intelligent life in the universe that has better rarefied environments than, than these particular rigs. But an interesting side effect is these processors generate no heat because they're superconducting. There's no resistance. So most of you that have seen data centers know that heat is the bane of data centers today. I spent lots of time, I'm an old data center guy, trying to reduce power and improve cooling in data centers. This processor, as it scales up in power, will generate no more heat. So for the problem sets that we talked about, this will be a dramatic energy savings. Happen to know Monte Carlo simulation, for instance, is the largest workload at Goldman Sachs. They run value at risk calculations all the time trying to manage their risk better. That this ultimately, and it might take a while, but could be replaced by a few handful of these chips. So pretty, pretty exciting potential there. I'm sorry for the eye chart here. <laughs> this is a bit, uh, a bit hard to explain. But this was a benchmark that we were asked to do by Google uh, before Google purchased a machine from us. And it's benchmarking classical ways of doing this particular benchmark problem versus what the D-Wave system does. So the red line you see on there is the D-Wave 2 system and how it performs. The y-axis is a log scale. It's the number of seconds, the medium time to best solution. So it's kind of a mouthful. And then the, the, the x-axis is the number of qubits, or the size of the problem. So you see fundamentally that the D-Wave quantum computer scales. It doesn't scale at all. It basically stays at the same time regardless of how big the problem is. These classical algorithms running on classical hardware scale exponentially. And some of these are, one is a, a product that, uh, from IBM called Cplex. The other are some, some well-known algorithms that people use. Mileage will vary on these. This is not indicative of performance you're going to see in all situations. But it is indicative of, of an important characteristic that we are seeing quantum mechanics here, at, at the advantage of that in the computation. And if you think about this, We've built something in about 10 years, which is now performing, maybe outperforming in narrow cases, that entire ecosystem of classical computing that's been built since 1948. Think of all the hardware and all the software algorithms that have been developed over that time, uh, and all the trillions of dollars that have been spent there. And here we've built something, a few of us up in Vancouver, British Columbia, that can outperform in some cases or even perform in the same ballpark as that entire computer ecosystem. So think about what we can do after a few more product cycles of this uh, type of technology. So let's talk a little bit about where this could go. So uh, this could be a technology that's 
uh, really game changing, really, and a, probably the most interesting thing that's happened in computer field in, in the last 30 or 40 years. And I say that because um, of these types of problems that scientists and researchers really haven't thought yet about how we can use this new tool in computation to solve problems that are beyond the scope of classical computing today. So an example that we talk about sometimes is in, in the finance space is we're working with several customers in, in the Wall Street area who look at this capability and they understand that they can provide uh, a technique within their organization to allow them to do trading in a very, very unique way to take advantage of this computational capability. So clearly you give a quant a tool that's differentiated, they will find a way to use it for their market advantage. Uh, so that's, a, that, that, that's just an example of one type of application that, that, that will be important. Again, it's not going to be used without other types of quantum computing resources. So I say it's like GPUs here. Those of you familiar with GPUs, um, are, they're used alongside classical processors. Uh, well, GPUs are classical processors, but they're used together in a hybrid computing environment. And the same will be true of quantum computing. My view is that in the course of 10 years, you'll see quantum computing resources be u as ubiquitous as classical computing resources. They'll be placed in the cloud, and with the cloud uh, out there as a, a predominant way of gaining computer access, it's a, it's a good time to be introducing something like a quantum computer. So you'll see this being uh, readily available by any, you're an iOS developer and you want to run, write an application, you could decide I, I'm going to use uh, quantum computing resources to do this, or you can decide I'm going to use classical resources to do this. So it'll be a level playing field in the computing business. The thing that has to happen is there needs to be um, more of a software ecosystem. And one thing we've done at D-Wave is, is develop partnerships with folks like OneQubit, and Phil Goddard will be presenting the work that they've done uh, using the D-Wave computer in the area of finance. But we have another company that we've partnered with called DNA Seek, who's doing work in bioinformatics and looking for drugs for, for cancer uh, and, and early testing for cancer. So there's a lot of exciting applications that we and our partners will be working on in this space over the next, the next few years. So the other thing that, that is uh, necessary is that uh, this kind of technology will require a different tool set uh, and the development of tools that um, leverage the quantum computing uh, resources. So things like compilers, it's very much like if you go back to the dawn of the microprocessor age, it was Bill Gates and Paul Allen that developed the first basic compiler for the, the, that chip that Intel had built, which was the dawn of the personal computer age. Here we're roughly at that same phase where we really are at the dawn of, of quantum computing. So stay tuned. Uh, I, I know this is a lot to pack into a, a short session, but we'd love to talk more about this and uh, look at our website, or, or I want it to tickle your interest in, in quantum computing. So thanks very much. Thank you.